Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, today we will build on things from yesterday and our goal in the morning and uh, the very beginning of the afternoon is to touch on each of these major subjects and identify issues that are critical uh, for models of suitability that we want to transfer across space or time. And um, so the first one will be theory part two. And I'm very excited about this. This is the first time I have put this all together in a talk. Um, so look forward to your feedback. The, the basis of this, however, is in a, um, a single paper that I did last year. And it's uh, something I did from a workshop that was really exciting. A workshop uh, in New York, uh, upstate, out of the city, at the Cary Institute. And it was people they brought together to think about biotic interactions, climate change, and how can we consider both of those issues for projections of species distributions into the future. And um, so this is the resulting paper. We have created a Dropbox folder where we're putting a few uh, key papers. And please feel free to do so uh, to share with the others as well. And so this will be up there fairly soon. So there's three parts of my talk. One is going to be about variables. The second is going to be um, about, how would I say? Well, we're going to see variables, and then there will be another section kind of linking that with other principles we study. And then the third uh, will be a, kind of a flow chart of how to link our suitability models of niches to spatially explicit uh, simulations that consider the realities of uh, what a species can occupy out of what it actually, um, uh, out of what is suitable. Okay? So the first part on variables. There's different classifications of variables. Um, so every variable, I think, uh, can and should be classified into three different uh, schemes in order to help us think about which variables we want to use and which kinds of variables uh, we should not use for this use. Yesterday we were talking about more practical things, about where to find variables and kind of classes of variables about what they talk about, but this is more conceptual, okay? So the first is uh, something Hutchinson came up with in synapoidic variables versus non-synapoidic variables. And we've talked about this a little bit. And remember the synapoidic ones are variables that are not, their values are not affected by the presence of our focal species. Okay? And synapoidic or non-synapoidic variables are variables that are. And so the latter were the kind of things that had feedback loops, loops say, between populations of two interacting species. Okay? This part rings the bell. And the, the ones on the top are typically uh, our climatic variables. So this little mouse run, running around in the forest is not affecting the overall uh, climate in its region. Okay, but for every variable, you need to think about um, whether it's synapoidic or not in the context of your species. Because if we were modeling uh, primates, for example, and we wanted to model humans, uh, climate would not be a synapoidic variable. Okay, based on these short times scales. Um, and. Uh, Okay, so let's move on. A second one is one of the classification schemes that Austin came up with. And I really, really like this Austin 2002 um, set of classifications. And that's part of his overall paper, but it's a part that's been very important for me. And one is the difference between proximal and distal. So the proximal variable is the one that actually determines the organism's response. A distal variable doesn't actually determine the species of the organism's response, but it's linked to the proximal variable that does cause the species response. So um, what's interesting about this is these distal variables um, can be linked either causally or they can be linked by some uh, non-causal correlation. But both of those are lit are distal and not proximal. Okay? And then Austin had another uh, classification that's independent of his first one, 
and this is indirect, direct, and resource. So uh, let's start at the top. So an indirect variable does not affect the species physiologically, whereas these other two do. And this indirect variable is correlated with the distribution of our species because of correlations that it has with other factors. So in some ways, it's kind of like a linked variable. So one variable may be indirect and be linked, right? But, but there's not a necessarily, it's not necessarily uh, one to the other, okay? These other two kinds, direct and resource, do affect uh, the, uh, the species physiologically, right? But there's a difference between them, but the direct variables are these variables that affect the species physiologically, um, but are not consumed by the species. These resource variables affect the species physiologically and are consumed by it. Okay, so these are our definitions, and there's a table in the paper which lets you see all of them all at the same time, uh, but I couldn't fit it all on one slide. <laughs> are these factors strictly physio physiological, or, I mean, a predator consuming a prey? Right. Um, that. Uh, yeah, I think that, yes, you could consider that, so this, we are modeling the predator or we're modeling the prey in your example? The prey. So the we're modeling the prey, so the... Oh, both. Okay, well, I mean, well, in our models right now, the, the state of the art is one at a time, <laughs> and then we can try to consider, people are trying to consider um, interactions between the two um, in for these Grinnellian models, okay? Um, so if we're modeling the prey, then I would say the predator uh, would be a direct, uh, a direct variable, right? Yeah, but but it fits the physiological. Yeah, because um, it, it affects survival or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so Austin was a botanist, and I I think he's still living and productive. Um, but he was thinking from the perspective of plants, and he was explicitly talking about plants, and so the examples he gives are with plants, but it turns out that they're also useful for animals. But um, maybe you have to think about physiologically in a bit broader terms. Very good question. Okay, shall we move on? The next slides give examples of these kind of variables, okay? So we'll see if we can make this more tangible. So synoquetic. Um, for most species, temperature or precipitation would be synoquetic. Um, whereas um, some plant examples, non-synoquetic variables um, that are affected by the plant um, is water or nutrients that the plant consumes. So the values of those variables are affected by the plant itself. Okay? So he didn't come up with it with synoquetic, non-synoquetic, Hutchinson did but this is uh, giving some kind of similar plant examples. Then proximal distal. So here's one pair of examples. So a proximal variable for one plant might be the available soluble concentration of phosphate at the root tip hair. Okay? It's as proximal as it gets, right? Um, whereas the distal variable could be the total soil phosphate in, in that system. Okay, um, and this is linked uh, probably in a causal way to the proximal variable, um, but remember that distal variables don't necessarily have to be linked uh, causally. Questions? <coughs> and then the green is another set of examples that I've given, um, that inspired by him. Um, so, Proximal variables for us on cactus. Um, it could be the freeze durations um, that affect survival of the cactus along its port pole, poleward range margin. So in North America, along the northern edge of the range, there's cactus that we know uh, their range is limited by you know, too many days of freezing in a row. Okay? And however, a distal variable 
could be the mean temperature of the coldest month, which might be uh, very related to the proximal variable and might end up being useful for us. But it's not a proximal variable because the species is not, I mean, any individual of that cactus is not responding to the mean temperature of the coldest month, and that's not really what's killing it. All right? Now, think about something else. Annual <coughs> mean temperature also could be a distal variable related to this same effect, right? This could be uh, also related with freeze durations. There can be a correlation between annual mean temperature and these freeze durations. Um, but this is even more distal than mean temperature of the coldest month. Okay? You have, how do you have the um, freeze duration? You have just, how do you have the, the climate variable with that information? How would you get that? Um, uh, and the same here that you have a mean temperature of the coldest month, and would be probably the limit for sure for those, uh, that variables limit uh, those days. Yeah. And how you have those specific days. How do you get that information? Um, I mean, you would have to have daily information. And then you make a, a, a map with yes. that area that is uh, right. present for. Right, right. And um, people have chosen this example because there's so much. Uh, data uh, on, it's called the Seguara cactus, um, that you know a lot about it, people have done local. Um, so you, you need, you only, you don't need to use all proxy, always proxy. Uh, okay, so only, the you, only if you have a lot of information about the species you are on, otherwise. Right, exactly. So the next three slides are going to be which uh, classes uh, and which categories should we use and which ones should we not and which ones should we use un only under certain circumstances. Okay. So um, just want to get the definitions and now some examples and then we'll think about when we have a green light, when we have a red light, and when we have a yellow light. Okay? Anyone else? Okay. So it, it is hard for me to remember the difference between proximal, proximal distal and direct and indirect resource, but like I say, it's in the table to look back for. And they're not exactly the same, but I think they're both very useful. Okay, so we still have our examples, and here I'm going in a different order. Oh, have we not given these examples? Okay, we haven't given these examples. All right, so uh, indirect variables uh, could be elevation, latitude, or longitude. Um, so definitely not affecting the species physiologically uh, in any direct way, um, except for maybe you know, hummingbirds and elevation. Well, actually probably not because it's not because of elevation, it's because of oxygen concentration, right? So it's probably still indirect, all right? Um, direct variables, temperature can be a direct variable. Uh, it can affect a species, but species don't consume temperature, right? Um, or pH, so aquatic things, right? Ocean and acidity, right? <laughs> um, so, and then resources, thinking about plants, he was thinking about uh, water or nutrients in the soil. Okay? We would have different uh, examples uh, for most animals. Okay, so this is the end of our examples. Go on. Okay, so what do we use, what do we not use? One of these is easy. So for this, the kind of math that's set up for Bernoulli <coughs> uh, niche models, you use synaquatic variables and you don't use non synaquatic variables. Yes? Uh, so we should not use the uh, land use like for the mapping for money? Um, why not? Because it's, it's, uh, it's directly affected by the presence of a species. Of which species? Uh, invasive, for example. <coughs> okay, so if it, yeah, so it depends on what species you're modeling. Okay. So if you are modeling, modeling? <coughs> yeah, if I'm modeling a mouse, right, and I want to know what is suitable today, and I have current records, then any is okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 There's questions. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, but 
In theory, it's very easy. So sometimes it's hard to figure out if it's a semi-quotic variable or not. Um, but but you should not use these. And why shouldn't you use them? Not just because Hutchinson said no, or Peterson said no, but why really mm -hmm. shouldn't you use these? Lack of independence. Yeah, the, and the the problem if if you have a non semi-quotic variable, the issue is much more complex than the math is set up to deal with. This math of the set base map, we're basically doing, um, in one way or the other, these techniques are talking about sub identifying subsets of multivariate space. So it's set based problems. And that map is not set up to deal with these feedbacks. Okay? So that was the easy one. All right? Question? No? Okay. Okay, so we'll walk through proximal and distal. Um, so, this is what we really, really would like to have, is these proximal variables, right? None of us may ever have the proximal variables. <laughs> you know, when we do, use them, okay? The distal variables, um, maybe, okay? They can be very useful, right? But only, um, so somehow they're correlated with the proximal driver. Otherwise, they wouldn't be useful, right? But we have to be very careful if we're transferring. So if you're not transferring, I think it's probably OK to say, yes, it's OK to use a distal variable and see if it works. But if you want to transfer, you have an additional assumption. And so only use this kind of variable for a model that you want to transfer if you are comfortable that that correlation is not going to break down across time or across space, whatever you're transferring. Because if that, if that variable works because of a certain correlation with the driving proximal variable, but that correlation changes in a different time period or changes in a different place, then it's no longer going to have the same information regarding the species response, which is what we care about. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, and so I'm not going to say it's easy to know if this correlation is going to be the same or not, but I'm saying if we use this variable and we transfer that model, this is what we're assuming, like it or not. Okay. Then indirect, direct, and resource, since there's three categories, it's a little more complicated. Um, these two aren't so bad. Direct variables, Use them. They're going to be fine. Okay? Not, not a problem. So if you have a, a variable that's direct and it was proximal on our last slide, I mean, you are gold. That is what we all would love to have. Resource variable um, is another maybe. So it affects our species physiologically and is consumed by it. Um, so use it if it's synaphoidic. So you're going to have to think about that dichotomy. Okay? And then indirect is another maybe. So it really is, is like the <coughs> similar to the one we just had of the distal. So it depends on that correlation, but it's actually more, um, it's more complicated than our, than our conclusion regarding the distal variables. So remember, let's, what are some of the examples we had of this, of indirect variables? Elevation. The elevation? That's too long to. Okay? So um, let's move on to the next one is going to expand upon this maybe. So we're just going to think about indirect right now. This is our last one. So indirect, there's some situations when you don't want to use indirect variables. Avoid them if they're correlated with the distribution of our species because of factors associated with dispersal uh, or local demographic factors, or because um, of associations with the distribution of important biotic interactors. If, this is, if that is why, if, if our species distribution uh, is correlated with indirect variables for these kinds of reasons, then 
um, including this is going to give us an unfair uh, representation of its, of its uh, tolerances for the other environmental variables that are actually driving the relationship. How do we know it? How do you know why? Yeah. So that's where you have to play a biologist. <laughs> okay? Just like I was talking with Philip. Um, you have to use whatever data and intuition and arguments you have, right? But, for example, latitude and longitude. Why do they work in establishing, say, uh, a model of the species range? What, I mean, so clearly they're not directly, the species is not directly responding to that, but it's responding to one or more factors that are associated with latitude and longitude, right? And if you wanted a model of the range, putting those in could really help you refine your model, right? Okay, but this is all for models of suitability. If you want a model of suitability, you don't use those. Okay, and in this example, you know, maybe you have, for example, you have a species that's found in the Pyrenees, but not in the Sierra Nevada, right? We'll return to that example for a little while. It would probably, using latitude, would probably get rid of any part of the prediction down in the Sierra Nevada, right? It would help you model the range, but if you want a suitability, that's doing something you don't want it to do, right? Um, because in this case, I would say that latitude is correlated with the distribution because of association with factors related to dispersal. Okay, so historical factors when you're thinking in those terms. Um, so that that would make it. This kind of variable could be included in what people call sensu stricto species distribution models, right? But we do not want to use it in a niche model or a sensu latu suitability species distribution model. Okay? Even if you don't want to transfer. Okay? Um, and I say dispersal slash demography kind of to be a bit more correct because sometimes you have. Um, Small, when you have this metapopulations, for example, there can be smaller areas of suitable um, distribution that are fine, but they're probably not going to be occupied often because of demographic factors. And so that can cause the same kind of problem. Um, but it's kind of just to, to keep people happy when they think about population biology. But dispersal is the big issue here. Okay. Um, biotic interactors are, you know, admittedly harder to understand, and this is definitely the, uh, the frontier of where the field is right now. Um, but for the same reason, if you have, uh, imagine that you have a lowland species, um, and there's, uh, in Iberia, there's one species in the north, and kind of imagine something in kind of drier areas. So you're across the drier areas that are not like on the coast of Iberia, but kind of Castilla la Vieja and Southern Aragon and whatever, okay? And then you have another sister species that's very similar habitat and it's farther south. And they come together therapeutically, right? So why is the northern species not found in the southern part of the peninsula in similar habitats? Probably competition. Probably if you didn't experiment and you got rid of individuals of the southern species, it would probably move down. Okay, so if you are a biologist and you're looking at your system and you say this smells like a biotic interaction limiting the distribution, then I would worry about that. I would worry about using variables that uh, are correlated <coughs> with this, dif this difference. Okay, but basically, latitude and longitude, since um, they're just things that are almost always going to be a problem for some reason. Okay. And uh, elevation for climate change studies is almost always going to be a problem because we know that it basically works for most species because it's correlated with temperature, right? But as climate is warm, temperature changes, but elevation doesn't change. So that correlation breaks. Okay, so that's actually a later thought. Okay. So I think it's fine to use indirect variables when they're correlated with the distribution of the species because of correlations with the driving abiotic factors. Rather than with these other classes. 
spotty interactions or the dispersal slash demographic one. Okay, so that's a green. However, if we want to transfer, we only should use these kinds of indirect variables if we are comfortable assuming that that correlation with the driver is going to be maintained across time or across space. Okay, so I think that is the end of the first section of the talk. Any questions at this point? So what I wanted is to present these ideas so that you can digest them and then look again at the table and think about things. Think about your system, which is the most important one, and think uh, about what questions or criticisms you would have. Anything at this point? <coughs>